So um, the last four weeks I spent on Hulk and on Hulk you do plastic surgery call. So I saw a lot of soft tissue infections on plastic surgery call and it left me with a lot of questions about what we do because there's some differing opinions from um, our point in the surgery standpoint regarding antibiotics. So um, I wanted to talk about diagnosis of abscesses, um, MRSA coverage for purulent skin and soft tissue infections, antibiotics after IND, primary organisms causing cellulitis, and the role of ceftriaxone in treating moderate to severe cellulitis. So the first case I'm going to talk about is a call I got from the community about a 25-year-old male who presented complaining of left arm pain. <coughs> and he admitted to injecting crystal meth into his forearm and thinks he might have missed. And uh, he had, a, from what the eMERGE doc told me, a large area of erythema and swelling on his left forearm, and the eMERGE doc then texted me a picture to show me what he meant, and I'll show you that in a minute. So the community ER doc did a point of care ultrasound to confirm presence of an abscess in that guy's forearm. And then he called us because he thought that the abscess that he did see was really deep and he didn't want to go after it and thought the patient might benefit from an OR. So this is a picture he sent me, and he was right. We ended up getting a formal ultrasound, and that guy went to the OR for uh, drainage and washout. But it made me wonder how much better is point of care <coughs> ultrasound than our own clinical exam when it comes to diagnosing abscesses. And there's actually a few papers out there about this. I'm only going to talk about two of them. So this was a prospective study done in California on 135 patients in an academic teaching hospital. And they included any patients with a chief complaint of cellulitis or abscess, but it had to be uh, keratinizing epithelium, so you couldn't, they couldn't use oral sites. Um, and the residents and staff were provided with 30 minutes of ultrasound training. And that sort of varied between studies. Sometimes it was as little as 15 minutes. Sometimes it wasn't really a formal training period. And uh, they used the linear probe, which um, when I was at St. Joe's Urgent Care, I couldn't find one um, to use on that abscess. I don't know if it's there or not, but um, anyways, this was a, what they um, defined as an abscess on ultrasound, so an anechoic or hypoechoic structure with poorly defined borders. It's usually spherical in shape. I don't know how well that projects, but this is going to help me. Okay, there. So poorly defined borders, usually spherical in shape, although it doesn't have to be, with a variable amount of internal echoes. And then this is an example of what they were looking for for cellulitis, and that's marked primarily by a cobblestoning appearance. So the way that this study worked is that they recorded a yes or no assessment of an abscess after their history and physical exam. And then they did their own point of care ultrasound, so it wasn't blinded. And then they re recorded a revised yes or no impression. All the patients with a pre-ultrasound assessment of yes got an IND or a needle aspiration. And um, patients with a pre-ultrasound assessment of no, it was up to physician preference. So after they did their ultrasound, they could make a decision about what they wanted to do. They could either have the patient followed up at seven days by phone and just treat them with outpatient antibiotics, or they could do an IND or needle aspiration if they chose to. And these were the results. So just to go over this briefly, clinical exam was actually fairly sensitive for abscess, so 86%, which is pretty good, I think. The specificity was a little bit lower at 70%. And then when you added point of care ultrasound into the picture, um, your sensitivity went up to 98% and specificity to 88%. So much better. Um, so in this study, point-of-care ultrasound did increase the diagnostic accuracy for detection of abscesses. And in cases where ultrasound disagreed with the physical exam, um, ultrasound was correct 94% of the time. And I think a good example of that was, uh, this is a one-off case that they reported, but um, one patient had a groin, what was thought to be a groin abscess, so they put the ultrasound probe on it and it actually turned out to be a pseudoaneurysm. So not a good thing to drain, because um, they saw a pulsatile motion and lack of internal echoes. So I mean, that's just an end of one, but it's a, it's a point of where ultrasound can be useful. Um, so 27 patients were lost to follow-up, and I think that that's a function of this being kind of a marginalized population. A lot of them didn't have a phone number to follow up. Um, there was no blinding, as I said. And we don't really know what happened to the patients after their IND. Because, after no ID, I'm sorry, because they were followed up by phone. So, I mean, you're relying on the patient to tell you whether or not their abscess resolved. They weren't, didn't, weren't subjected to repeat physical exam or ultrasound. Um, obviously, it wouldn't have been ethically sound to IND patients who had a negative clinical assessment and a negative ultrasound. So they were sort of stuck with that as their outcome. And also, um, ultrasound picked up a lot of 
abscesses that were questionably clinically significant. So and one of them was half of a CC. So I don't know, I mean, that could have potentially responded to antibiotics alone, but it was drained. And this is the second study. I'm just going to talk about it very briefly because it's very similar to the first study. Um, but uh, they focused a little more on patients with a clinical cellulitis and no obvious fluid collection. And in this study, point of care ultrasound changed the management in 56% of the cases. So in summary, clinical exam is actually pretty sensitive for abscess detection. We do a pretty good job um, without ultrasound. But ultrasound makes our clinical diagnosis better. And that doesn't say anything about patient outcomes and whether it makes patient outcomes better. I can't say that. But um, it does make our clinical diagnosis better. So maybe the patients for whom this would really provide a benefit would be people who aren't going to follow up. So marginalized populations, you know, psych patients, IV drug users, homeless people. Um, it might be a benefit to know right off the bat what you're dealing with because if they get worse, they may not come back. One of the second uh, questions I had about that case was uh, whether or not I always need empiric MRSA coverage for purulent skin infections. There's actually a lot of studies out there about this. I chose to, to talk about briefly, um, one was in the New England Journal of Medicine. I chose that one because it's very comprehensive. Um, and then the second one I chose because it was done here in London. So it obviously has a lot of implications for our local practice and um, sensitivities here. The New England Journal of Medicine study was a prospective prevalence study of adult skin and soft tissue infections. And they looked at um, emergency departments in 11 US cities, excluded all perirectal abscesses, and swabs of all the purulent sites were cultured. You can see that nice example of an MRSA abscess there. Um, 422 patients were enrolled. MRSA was isolated in 59% of their wound cultures, which is pretty high. Only 7% of the isolates were streptococcal. Um, interestingly, only 27% of patients who came back positive for MRSA in their wounds had risk factors for hospital-acquired MRSA. And that's, that was a clinical um, diagnosis. So these people um, had the absence of, say, um, a hospital admission in the past year or being on dialysis or had an indwelling Foley and other things that you would associate with probably hospital-acquired MRSA. And 99% of the MRSA, MRSA strains when they did genotyping were characteristic of community-acquired strains. Um, in the New England Journal of Medicine study, 100% were susceptible to, susceptible to SEPTRA. And 95% were susceptible to clindamycin, but as we're going to talk about in a minute, that's actually a little bit different in London. 57% of the patients with MRSA infection got antibiotics with no MRSA coverage. But there was actually no difference in outcome between people who had MRSA infection, who got uh, in antibiotics that covered MRSA versus those that didn't. And that might be an argument for saying that for a lot of these patients, IND alone was probably sufficient and they may not have needed antibiotics anyway. Um, and that's a finding that's been um, substantiated in other studies as well. So I guess that, that article is good, it's comprehensive, but it doesn't really tell us um, about MRSA and skin and soft tissue infections here. Um, resistance has geographic variations. Um, and bacterial makeup does as well. So I looked at this study as well that was done here. And this was just published this past year. So I'm sure a lot of you have probably heard about this study before, so I'm not going to spend too long on it. But um, it was a prospective observational study of a chief complaint of skin or soft tissue infection in three academic emerges in London. And they excluded um, a small number of patients that had uh, abscesses that would be associated with different kinds of bacteria. So they included things, everything from cellulitis to um, abscesses to ulcers. Um, involved 205 patients, and they did two things. So they defined colonization and infection. So colonization was people who had um, nares or throat cultured for MRSA, and then infection was uh, infection sites cultured for MRSA. And they found a bunch of um, predictor variables associated with MRSA infection and colonization, which in, there's a bit of overlap there, but in summary, incarceration in the past year, known exposure to MRSA, competitive sports, homelessness, and previous abscess in the past year um, were associated with uh, MRSA colonization or infection. Um, they found that MRSA was the only organism <coughs> isolated in 22% of purulent skin and soft tissue infections, um, but overall about 17% of patients were colonized or infected with MRSA. So quite a few. 
Um, 71% of the patients with MRSA had community-acquired MRSA, so that means the absence of risk factors for hospital-acquired MRSA, so that's a clinical uh, diagnosis. And 82% of the MRSA isolates uh, by genotyping were characteristic of community-acquired. Um, here, 100%, again, were susceptible to SEPTRA and VANCO, but only 75% were susceptible to clindamycin. Um, about 70% of patients with MRSA got antibiotics with no MRSA coverage, but as we talked about with the, with the New England Journal of Medicine study, if, those, if they were abscesses that got drained, it might not have made that much of a difference for some of them. Um, so the bottom line, I think, for those two studies is that MRSA is responsible for a lot of purulent skin and soft tissue infections, and probably some non-purulent ones as well. Um, but most MRSA skin and soft tissue infections happen in people without any risk factors. So it's a bit hard to decide who warrants MRSA coverage and who doesn't. So I think that the bottom line is that empiric MRSA coverage should be considered in most purulent skin and soft tissue infections. The last question that I had about that particular patient was whether or not we need to use antibiotics for an abscess after IND. And I'm going to talk about um, a, um, a study that reviewed a bunch of studies and then a study that came out in the same year um, uh, that was not reviewed included in this study. So. Um, so in the Annals of Emergency Medicine, um, they looked at six studies. Um, three were RCTs, um, and of the RCTs, one had no blinding or placebo group. One only involved 50 patients, and one had patients who, as part of their treatment, got Caflex, but 52% of their abscesses grew MRSA, so um, it's a bit of a limitation of their study, I guess. And then three cohort studies, um, and of the three, basically all of them found that there was no difference in resolution after IND for an infection for patients getting antibiotics to which MRSA is resistant versus to which MRSA is susceptible, which would imply that um, it doesn't really matter whether you treat them or not. So in all six studies, there was no difference in resolution for antibiotics versus no antibiotics or antibiotics that weren't effective against your infection after IND. But that doesn't answer a lot of questions. So they didn't tease out who had overlying cellulitis and who didn't. And 